Everything was great. It was great. Why, why am I blurry? Nee. Hello my beautiful blossoms and welcome to my channel. My name is Mila and here we talk about art, entrepreneurship, makeup, and being creative in general. So today is Makers and Makeup Monday, which is a series that I have created that talks about interesting entrepreneurs, interesting artists, makers, uh, creators. And today I am super excited because we are going to talk about one of those people who are multi-talented and I always enjoy talking about them. So today we're actually going to talk about Frederick Hubbard Gwynn. Have you heard of him? Believe me, you'll know who he is as we go on. He is super cool and had such a tragic life like so many of the artists do. So if you want to find out more, stick around. Oh, and I put my makeup on at the same time because you know, that makes perfect sense. Actually, I do it to keep myself busy. Otherwise, as you can see, ADD runs away with me. Okay, here we go. Uh, I do not tell you what products I'm using because it will take forever. And as you can tell, I can talk. So what I do... Maui, can you just stop? <laughs> um, so what, what I usually do is I just list everything that I use in the description box below. And I will be looking this way because that is where my mirror is. Let us begin. So Frederick Hubbard Gwynn was actually referred to as the monster with the heart of a child. Now, why do you say that when this guy was an accomplished artist, an established author, and an amazing character actor? Does this ring a bell? Come on. Come on, folks, does this ring a bell? So he uh, was born on July 1926, and he was born in New York City. New York City. In the 1920s, New York City was uh, right over the Great War and the economy booming. There was a lot of prosperity and success happening, and he was born right into that time. Now, his father, his name was Frederick, and he was a very successful stockbroker, and his father had an incredible, fun, outgoing, charismatic personality that Fred just absolutely loved. And he uh, had a mother, Durr, who was also a creative. Her name was Dorothy, and she was artistic, a really good illustrator. As a matter of fact, she was the one who created a comic book called Sunny Jim, which was fairly successful. So he had like a lot of creative genes. Not those kind of genes, you know what? In his self. Now, as I mentioned earlier, he loved his dad. His dad was a lot of fun and he spent a lot of time with him, but his mother was also all into Fred. She doted all over him. She made sure that every need was met because he was one of their children that actually uh, survived. They tried having kids, her and her husband before, and a little bit more makeup. It turned out that two or three of the children have actually uh, died which was tragic. So he grew up amongst uh, a real American aristocracy. He had a beautiful house in Florida, like a summer house. And actually his summer house was right next door to the Kennedys. So they were pretty well off. At eight years old, something tragic happened in Fred's life that changed him forever. His father, whom he adored, has passed away. It was a really sudden death. He went in for a uh, routine sinus surgery and just never came out and that always scares the crap out of me I don't know about you guys but you hear like these stories of even there was a case a few years ago when a woman went uh, overseas to get her boobs done and uh, she died like Jesus Christ he was devastated and he really just withdrew into the world of his own and he started cartooning he started drawing and illustrating his thoughts on paper and it turned out that he was like really really good he had a really great mom 
who understood where he was coming from, who encouraged him, who was just an incredible person sharing her experiences with him as far as being an illustrator, encouraging him to explore his talent, his desires, and she was one of those mothers that really had his back, so to speak. And in junior high, he really had a huge growth spurt, like just a beanstalk, you know? All of a sudden, he's the tallest kid in class. He's towering over everybody. He's lanky and uncomfortable like most, you know, teenagers or preteens are. And he's really unsure of himself. But again, his mom always made him feel very, very loved. She made him feel like he's uh, the cat's meow. And uh, he never felt out of place. He never felt that he was, you know, being made fun of. He was just always a fun, outgoing, confident guy around other people. Now, he's growing, literally, height-wise as well. He's growing. And now it is 1939 and he has entered a really fancy schmancy elite East Coast prep school called Groton. And in there, he really just took off. He was funny. He was outgoing. People loved him. He sang in a choir and turned out that he had a really, really good voice. He did great in art. And he also studied all forms of art as well as joining a drama program in his school. And he discovered that he was also an incredible actor. He was really good. So at this point, I think his growth spurt has pretty much ended. Thank God, because the guy was six feet, five inches tall. He was huge. <laughs> he had like a longish face and um, very intimidating giant voice. He was a character. He stood out like you knew who he was. He walked by you like, oh, hello, Fred. And then in 1941, we know what happened in 1941, right? We all know what happened in 1941. Yeah, America entered World War, War, War? World War II. And at that time, he was still in school, but all the boys, most of the boys wanted to go to the front. They wanted to fight for freedom. And it was a very patriotic time in American history. Well, in 1944, Fred has graduated high school now. And he, of course, enlisted in the Navy. In the Navy. So he served for two years in the Navy on a battleship, which is kind of cool. Come on, battleship. He was a radio operator and he hated it because all he had to do was listen to Morse Gold all day long. He said he had a horrible headache all the time. It just kept beeping in his head. He really did not like it at all. He served, he, I think, I believe he asked to transfer from that position and he cried to his supervising officer, like big giant crocodile tears. He's like, I can't take this anymore. It actually worked. They transferred him to a different department. I don't remember where, but he got that job. Now in 1946, after his service, he came back, seasoned military man, and he went to Harvard. So in Harvard is where he found his real outlet for the artistic talents that he had. Plus, in addition to all of that, he was super witty. Like he was a smart, quick kind of guy. And he became one of the people on staff of Harvard Lampoon. So by the 1950s, his gift for satire really made him popular, really popular. And he actually became the president of the Notorious Humor magazine. He was funny all on his own, and he became active in the Brattle Theater, which was school theater, and he realized that he was really, really good at being on stage, and he, at that time, just completely fell in love with theater. The real love comes later. In 1950, when he was in Harvard, he met this beautiful socialite, Foxy Reynard. He met her at a friend's wedding. I know this looks weird. It'll get better. And her actual name was Jean. Jean Fox Hurinar was a granddaughter of the New York City mayor, William J. Gaynor. You know, she was a socialite. She was a social butterfly. She was beautiful and she was smart. They really hit it off and they dated for quite a while. And then a year later, they married in 1952. They had a beautiful wedding. Everybody who knew anybody came and they really had a great start to their relationship. He was happy. So his wife, I watched an interview and his wife describes him as an introvert. She said that he really 
Lee was the life of the party. He really enjoyed being around other people, or so they thought. But then when they would leave, he'd go, oh, I thought they'd never leave. He was able to project that persona of being super, super social and outgoing. She said that he was funny and charismatic, but inside just wanted people to leave so he could be alone and do his thing, which usually meant working in his studio, creating drawings or painting or writing. So, ooh, yikes. All right, let's take care of that. So at 25 years old, he decided to give theater another chance. And not just another chance, but like a real serious shot. He loved the stage, he was really good at it. He uh, was able to remember the lines really well. And because he had such a s interesting um, exterior, shall I say, uh, he really got some good roles and he was able to carry them with his talent. So because of that, he was very, very well received in his performances and he headed over to New York City. Because you know, where, where, where else would you go? It's, it's even New York or LA, right? So he went to New York City, try his luck as a stage actor and green actor. Foxy and him moved to New York City. You know, it was an artistic hub. Like we said, it was booming. He started looking for work. It was actually rejected quite a few times due to his unique look. Some people say, oh, your, your lantern jaw is just a little too jawy or what, dude, you're like really tall and skinny. He couldn't really find a the right role for him. He was tenacious. Tenacious is definitely a trait that comes across most of the artists that I have been researching. And don't give up, don't surrender. And eventually you will succeed seems to be the underlying current here. So he got his first big break when he landed a supporting role in a Broadway play, Mrs. McThing, alongside Helen Hayes. And Helen Hayes was a big deal back then. So he did a really good job and he started to get noticed. Now next year, his first son was born, Kieran. And um, that was like the happiest you know, day of his life. Kieran was a really cute, outgoing baby. Uh, the family was super duper happy, as a family would. Unfortunately, a horrible, tragic thing happened to the little boy. He had a cerebral hematoma and ended up having serious brain damage. And as a result of that, he also had really bad seizures. So this just completely devastated Fred and he threw himself into work. He didn't really spend a lot of time at home and him and his wife Foxy was starting to have some issues, which is, you know, sort of expected after such a tragic thing happens to you and your family. So in 1954, Ilya Kazan gave him a really interesting part on the waterfront, which was a huge hit, and he was just acting. He was trying to do as much as he could because, you know, his family needed money. They needed to survive and he would do whatever it takes like any good parent would. Now, the reason I'm looking around is I'm going, uh, where are my shadows? We are looking for blue. You know, he did what every good father would do. He started looking for additional work. Now, this was a really eventful year because 1954, an additional thing that happened that was super exciting was that his daughter Gaynor was born and he was smitten with that little girl, let me tell you. He loved her, he played with her, but really wasn't like really into the whole doing daddy duties thing. His wife described him as more of like an amazing playmate. He would make her laugh. She loved being in his company. But then when it came to things like changing your diaper or feeding, anything practical, he seemed to have no, have no interest in that. But then like it was the 50s, so I don't know. Did guys really do that in the 50s? I don't know. Don't know. If you know, let me know. So he spent hours in the studio and he just did not participate with the kids very much. It caused more issues with his wife in the marriage. She wanted him to be more involved and he just didn't have it in him. 
but that didn't stop them from having more children. In 1956, they had a son, Evan. Evan was the perfect little boy. He was everything that Fred and Foxy wanted. Damn, that's not even. I'm gonna have to fix that. It is so hard to talk and do makeup, dudes. I cannot even tell you, but we're getting better, right? Right? Yes, I think so. So to provide for his family, he took on another job. He became a copywriter for a really famous ad company in New York City. And for the next several years, he juggled his job and he juggled his stage acting appearances, which was not easy, let me tell you. But he didn't give up. He kept going and he became more and more successful as time went on. He was lucky because he had a really understanding boss. His boss was on board with the fact that Fred was trying to get his acting career going and he allowed him to leave to do his creative stuff, which was, I thought was pretty cool. I mean, how many bosses are gonna be like, and that's all right, you can leave early so you can go and, you know, act. So that was cool. So in 1958, he created Best in Show Book of Pets and Their Lookalike Owners. Uh, and this is the time where he really got into writing, into illustration, into caricatures. He was a really, really good illustrator. He had a keen eye for interesting, funny things, and he had a great way to just portraying them. So he was really well received. The book was a huge hit. I'll, I'll link it somewhere. Where do I have them? I don't know. We'll figure it out. And then in 1960s, he wrote, and in 1960, he wrote another book, which was called What's Nude, instead of What's New, get it? Like a play on words. And it was actually like a racy cartoons for adults. I looked at the pictures, super fun. So he continued to pursue his artistic talents and he never really looked for a job. They always sort of seemed to come to him. He was rarely home spending time with his family. And again, that just caused even more tension between him and his wife. But you know, she loved him. So she kind of stuck around. In 1960, he got an offer to appear on Broadway in Irma La Douce and it brought him back on stage and he loved being on stage. In 1961, he was called to star as Sergeant Bilko in Car 54 TV sitcom. I still remember it. Mm, reruns, but I remember that show and I thought it was pretty good. He loved it and he was really good at it. He was an incredible comedian and alongside his co-star Alt Lewis, they rocked it. They became really good friends and they hung around together after the show. So of course the show became a success and at 35 he became a household name. People knew and recognized him not only because of his interesting looks but because of his incredible acting. And he was really, you know, getting a following. He was uh, being successful. He was being recognized. Did he love it? Mm, yes and no. He wanted to be successful and to kind of change the world. I feel like so many creatives do. And also was an introvert. Like again, so many creatives are. It's a weird dichotomy but it's true. His wife Foxy and him had Dylan. He was happy, everything was going great. And then on July 12th, 1963, he was filming an episode of Car 54 and he got a phone call. And in the interview, Al Lewis said that he remembers his face just changing. And he got the news that his little boy Dylan drowned in their home's pool and it just destroyed him. It made him withdraw and he threw himself into work. He started working day and night. So because of that, of course, the relationship became to suffer and they eventually separated that same year. He returned to the set and just kept working and working and working and working and he kept his feelings inside. Like he never talked about what happened with his children and his wife. He never really discussed it with anybody, not his friends, not anyone. He kept everything inside. 
and he juggled a Broadway appearance that he was in and he continued to act in Car 54 series until they were actually canceled two years later. So he was going through all of this for two years without anybody, you know, without asking for any kind of help or support emotionally. That was, uh, that was tough. But he continued to want to grow his acting career and he got a call from Hollywood within a few months after Car 54 was canceled to star in a new and upcoming series. Can you guess what they are? If you know his name, you know. He got offered a main role in the sitcom, The Monsters. Oh my God, I love that show. I used to watch it all the time. I thought it was hysterical. Don't judge me, okay? And in The Monsters, he was Uncle Herman and Al Lewis was his co-star as the grandpa, the vampire. So he agreed. He signed on, but he didn't really want to do it because it wasn't really like his cup of tea. He was more into serious roles and being a big giant green beanstalk didn't really appear to him. But you know what? He was going to make it work because he needed the money. Now he had children and family he still had to support and he decided to do whatever he had to do. So his wife and him actually reconciled. They thought that him moving to LA, to Hollywood is a good change of scenery. It would bring them closer together and they got back together which I thought was pretty freaking cool so on September 24th 1964 the monsters came out on air and they were a huge hit everybody loved them and the funny thing is that as much as he didn't really want to do that role, how he played Herman made all the difference in the world. He was great. Do you remember the monsters and that laugh? Oh, 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 oh. Come on. His laugh became like a trademark of him in that show. And now my interpretation is definitely going to become a trademark, right? Anyway, the show became a really huge success. It became a national phenomenon and it just started becoming really heavily merchandised as well. So there was monster cups and monster mugs and monster t-shirts and figurines. And I think there was like a, wasn't there a cereal too? Like I feel like there was a cereal, but I could be wrong. I don't know. As time went on, it became less and less loved by Fred. And the worst part that he hated was all of the prep that involved getting him into role, into costume. He had to put on that suit and the makeup and he had to wear, you know, a lot of extra things underneath. And it said that it took like two to three hours just to get him going and he suffered terribly he sweated like crazy and he lost so much weight that people were like starting to get worried about him he had to take salt supplements just to keep himself hydrated and drink gallons and gallons of water one time al remembers that when he took off his costume and he took off his boot remember he used to wear those platform boots to make him even taller even though he was already six five he would just pour sweat from in the boot like it was just insane and he you know he was dehydrated a lot of the times and he really started to really hate it he became frustrated with the writing in the show and like he felt like the jokes became repetitive there was no where that the show was actually going he says there's just so many times that i can go oh, 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 and you know lift the kid off and put him down and it's just a lot of slapsticks which worked uh you know for a while but you have to have the show I guess evolve towards the and he was not a fan he would get into arguments with the writers he was just not a happy boy in 1966 they tried to create a further memento for the show uh, however it was just canceled anyway after two years so the other thing lasted two years car 54 now this show lasted two years as well he seems to have a two-year thing he realized he hated this particular role and he also realized that after he got out of being on the show he was looked upon as the monster Herman there's very little that he could do to sort of un harmonize himself when he went to try out for new roles that were like a little bit more serious the uh, directors or the producers were like Herman the monster get out of here we're not casting him 
So he had a really hard time with finding and expanding his repertoire, so to speak. It is 1967 and he is 41 years old and he decided to move back to New York City because there's really nothing that he could see going well for him in Hollywood. So he went back to New York and he was happy to be back. He really just wanted to retire at that point. He's like, he's, he's made a lot of money, you know, enough where he could think about retiring and he wanted to retire from the public life. He was done, or was he? And he, you know, at that time he spent a lot more time at home with his family. And he also had another little girl named Maddie that was born in 1965. So he had a full house. Foxy and him had a lot of fights. They didn't get along. They were always arguing. And he started drinking heavily and that caused even more problems as one would assume and they just did not have a they didn't have a good relationship they didn't have a good marriage and that added a lot of stress he was a little bit more involved with his kids now that he uh, was a little bit older but not by much continued to act though he took a role in a tv show and plays and he really tried to reinstate his reputation as a multifaceted kind of actor which he was but it took some time because herman just stung gone and ruined it so in 1970 he got a role in Anderson and Company and it failed to catch so the network passed on the series so he was like ah, all right he's gonna keep trying and then he turned to one creative outlet that he had sole control over which was his art he was an artist at heart he would be in his studio and he would be drawing and painting and illustrating and something fun happened actually his daughter and him were having like these conversations you know they were having these fun times and she asked him daddy what's that on your nose and he says oh it's a mole She's like, oh, okay and then maybe like a few days later they went outside and after the lawn was mowed the little girl noticed that there was this tiny cute little animal running around and she asked him daddy what's that and he said well that's a mole and his daughter he just saw like her little wheels move like little wheels in her head moving around and because just earlier they were talking about a mole on his nose and now there's a mole running around on the grass and he laughed and he realized like where her brain was going and that inspired him to do this whole big book series which he called daddy says he has a mole on his nose so that inspired him to do a whole whole other series of children's books such as the king who reigned and the chocolate mousse for dinner and the little pigeon toad and these books became really hugely successful so he really loved making them and people loved reading them however he still wanted to prove himself as an actor so he just took on roles he made his comeback as a real serious actor and he continued to play roles that he really really loved now, when he was 53, he established himself as a serious actor, finally. And in 1979, he was 53 years old and he was approached by Bernardo Pedalucci, who offered him a role in Luna. And that really was a huge push for his career. He really enjoyed playing that role. Also in that year, unfortunately, his wife, Foxy and him got divorced after 28 years together. She just, she couldn't take it anymore. And you know, they grew apart. I mean, it happens. People grow apart. So they got divorced. In 1980, he moved into Manhattan's Upper West Side. And you know, he was doing his thing. He was living his life. He enjoyed being a bachelor after all of those years. And then his friend introduced him to a 30 year old Deborah Flair. Now who is a 30 year old Deborah Flair? Well, she actually worked as a uh, book publisher and he was currently working on writing another book. 
so they met and they had so much in common it was kind of like like at first sight and they really got along she really believed in him and he really loved himself a strong woman and she certainly was that and she was very supportive of him very understanding because they were sort of like in the same industry so to speak in 1984 francis coppola asked him to star in a movie called the cotton club with richard Gere and bob hoskin and he and hoskin wrote some scenes together for that movie and they just had an amazing chemistry and it was a really really big success he was very happy with it so he got attention from other directors and he started appearing in a lot of films and playing a lot of roles he actually wanted to play. He was happy, his life was stable, he was in love. So on March 9th of 1988, he proposed to Deb and she, she said yes. So it was good. Everything was great. He was living his life. He was happy. In 1989, he wanted to show a little bit more of his art. Art was always a huge part of his life. He had an exhibition, guys. The exhibit was called Drawn and Quartered. It was featuring paintings that kind of like showed his love of wordplay. So the opening night was a zoo, of course everybody wanted to get in everybody wanted to see and everybody was very excited so it was a huge success and at that age when most people are retiring he was actually in his creative prime people wanted him for the roles they recognized his name he was the guy he continued to land roles in a lot of films you would probably remember Stephen King's Pet Cemetery. he was in that and another one that he was in is called disorganized crime at 63 they decided to move out of New York City they thought that maybe all of this excitement and kind of being confined in a smaller space wasn't good for them so they moved to Maryland they bought a farm it was a beautiful place it had like 20 acres I want to say but I'm not a hundred percent but it was it was a pretty big place people were saying like you really need to get rid of that thing but they fell in love with the architecture of the place they liked the way it was set up inside so they decided to renovate it and it took a lot of time and money to do but they were renovating it and that was trying to turn it into like a real profitable farm so they were started thinking about like how else can he make some extra money because they just dumped a whole lot of money into renovating this house so they decided that he was going to try and do voiceovers which is like brilliant right voiceovers doesn't take a lot of time he could do it from the comfort of his own home it paid for his lifestyle which was kind of cool he continued to paint and to draw in his large beautiful studio that he had built separate from the main house on the ranch and at that time even though he really wasn't accepting too many roles he did accept a role in my cousin Vinny they offered him the role of a southern judge and he played it beautifully I still remember the scene where Joe Pesci is questioning the witness and he's like so uh, where were you two youths you two youths were there and uh the judge aka Fred goes say what say what to what youths youths you know youths that was so funny I am sure I butchered that scene but I rem I remember watching it and laughing my ass off I'm like yeah youths yeah we say that in Brooklyn we do we do we do say that in Brooklyn so anyway, as you know, that movie was a huge success. 1993, he started to like have some pain. And by some pain, I mean like he started having real severe back pain where to the point where he couldn't really walk um, and he got really worried. So they went to the doctor and unfortunately they were told after several tests and scans that he had advanced stages of pancreatic cancer. It was spread all over his body. There's really not much that they could do at this point but just make him comfortable. They gave him about six months to live. Needless to say, the family was completely devastated. His wife was very, very upset. 
and his children were very, very, I mean, you know, it was terrible. So what happened at this point was that Fred started saying basically his goodbyes to everyone. He was talking to his kids. He was doing all the things that he wanted to do. So he spent a lot of time in his studio. He spent a lot of time painting and drawing and doodling, creating new works. He just wanted to leave a legacy behind, you know, like I totally understand that. He wanted to be remembered. He wanted to leave a piece of himself when he's gone. I mean, it is totally understandable. Understandable. And he spent a lot of time with his friends, he spent a lot of time with his family, and he ended up dying on July 2nd in 1993. And he died in his sleep, peacefully from what I have read, and it was only eight days before his 67th birthday. So his memory lives on in his work, in all the movies that he did, in his kids. I just thought this story was just so incredibly inspirational. I found him to be so focused and just, you know, whenever I see people believing in themselves and pursuing what they want to do, even though it may not be like a traditional kind of gig because we all hear our parents saying like, why don't you just be a doctor or a lawyer? So that is the story of Fred Gwynn. What did you think? Did you love it? I thought it was pretty cool. And I got so into telling the story, I forgot to do some of my makeup, which is a-okay. I am just gonna throw on some lip gloss here, which is very beautiful. So when I was looking through his work and I looked online to see what his books look like, they're fabulous. They're just so funny. He had such a great sense of humor. I would love to hear from you guys. If you find like that you relate to him in any way, if you are a creative sort of a poison or not, did you ever go through something where you just keep searching for that right thing to do. Sometimes I feel like you can be good at something, kind of like thrown into doing it, just because you have a talent in that particular area, but you don't necessarily love that job. Does that make sense? Like you're good at it, but you don't love it. And uh, that's it. So I hope you guys loved hearing about Fred Gwynn and his life and hope it encouraged you to not give up to explore your talents and to just kind of keep trying and getting better at things, you know? You're like, I feel like people who think that they have reached the peak of their growth, you just become satisfied. And I feel like for me personally, I'm never satisfied. I always want to learn more. I always want to figure out how to do something new. And I think it kind of keeps me from going crazy right now, to be honest with you because now we're learning how to do YouTube and YouTube seems to be good to us. Let's let our hair down, why don't we? Yeah, I spent like uh, an hour doing my hair because I suck at it so bad. What do you think? This part kind of sticks out. Anyway, thank you for watching. I appreciate it so much. Thank you for coming here. If you want to support me and my channel, please do all the YouTube things, which is ring the bell, subscribe if you like it, make a comment if you have something to say. I always read all my comments and I appreciate it so much. If you want to support me, I'm a small business owner. The website is mila-such.com and that is where I show you my accessories. That's my store. I make accessories for my paintings and my illustrations. And I would be so happy if you would check it out and maybe buy one if you want to support me. If not, just check it out. Uh, we're cool. Just come back and listen if you're interested. And I'm going to see you in my next one. Have a wonderful week. Mwah. No, that's not what I do.